Hello, everyone. I'm just here to do the intro and check in on accountability and see how everyone's doing, if there's anything that anyone would like to share or how things are going for them, if you've been utilizing the success system. Anyone? Anyone? We will have Stephanie Coates teaching Win the Seller today, so that will help with your listing presentations how to qualify a seller, the pre-listing criteria, and demonstrating your experience in handling buyer's objections with business. So she, Stephanie has been a real estate agent for 18 years and a producing agent for 18 years. And we're lucky to have her teach this class. And she is coming from another meeting. So she'll be here in just a few minutes. So feel free to discuss anything you want to discuss or ask me any questions while you have me share any success stories i know sophie just had a listing go live last week she's on the leaderboard for rookie for our congratulations thank you and i did have a question i texted you about it actually about the mass emails have you been able to find anything about that i you know, I'm sorry. Sorry. My, phone just on. my phone just went so i'm getting to go <laughs> okay, let me stupid technology, love it and hate it. Yeah, I'm like, how yeah, did my... you even join by yourself? So, <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, perfect, we're done there. But I was going to talk to Kayrie and she's been in a meeting, so I will talk to her as soon as I get off this call and I'll text you back. Okay, great, thank you. I had, we're prepping for that trunk or treat, and I got distracted. <laughs> got no distracted. Worries. Thank you. Uh, Angelina is one of our newer agents that just joined us, joined us. And so if you want to give a shout out of where you are, Angelina is in the Roseburg area. And Sophie's in Klamath Falls. And then Alex and Sung, I don't know where you two are out of. Uh, I'm out here at the uh, Sunset Corridor in Hillsboro. I'm also from Sunset Cor Corridor. So up north more. It should just be a couple more minutes with her jumping on. Does anybody else have any listings headed their way or talking to sellers? Um, I don't have any more oh, sellers. Well, I have that the lender I'm working with who wants to list his home, but he's working on renovation, so it's on his timeline right now. Um, but I'm in es escrow with the more buyers right now. Good. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. It's kind of with the for sale by owner. It's a kind of a unique situation, so it's been different than anything I've done in the past. I, you know, I feel like I'm doing both sides, but yeah, for a lot. sale by owner is hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's hard to have those. We need to get everything done, but I'm not getting paid by you conversations. <laughs> right, right. And they, you know, these people are so sweet, but they do think they know everything. So it's kind of mm -hmm. hard to tell them that, you know, that's not necessarily right. I do have to do it this way. But so just some yes. roadblocks here and there. Yes. Well, work them for a referral when you're done, if they learn something from you, right? Yes, exactly. And Carson, I said before you jumped on that we're just waiting for Stephanie to come in to start class. But if you have any uh, success system wins or anything you'd like to share with the group that might be helpful to everyone else, feel free to shout that out now. Um, and yeah. And yeah, just... no, this is my first training. So, I mean, oh. I've just started. So, yeah, I just here to learn and figure out what's going on. So. Awesome. Yeah, we usually take the first couple minutes of class to kind of share and um, network if needed and uh, 
Stephanie is coming from another class, so she should be popping in any minute, and then I'll hand the baton to her. She's been an agent for 18 years, and she's going to be going over when with the sellers. Okay, awesome. Hello, Ray. I'm going to repeat myself a little bit. Sorry, you all. Um, we're just waiting for Stephanie to come from another class. If you have some successes you want to share with the group or anything you might that might be helpful with, for another agent to hear about, feel free to jump in and share that at any time. Do open houses, lots of open houses. <laughs> yes. The only way. <laughs> <laughs> Open houses are a great way to build your sphere and start getting people into your CRM. Yeah. I've already got two booked for this Sunday, so I'm covered for Sunday. Just need awesome. some for Saturday. That's awesome. Yeah, I was just... I have an 18 year old daughter getting into real estate and I was like, we got to start those open houses. <laughs> Here we go. Get That's, to know some people. I have a one year old. And I'm wanting to make him my little prodigy. He goes to showings with me and he'll stop in at open houses and stuff. But open houses are also just great to make you feel like you can do it. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I, in the beginning, I didn't know where to start. And I just was like, you know, I'm just going to get over my fear and just do an open house and, and end up being a lot of fun. And it just made me realize that it's not that scary. You can do it. <laughs> This is, yeah, this is a business of relationships, right? And all you're doing is putting yourself out there and making those first connections to build relationships with people. And that kind of takes away the fear of, of having to jump in. Yeah, it's kind of just like ripping the Band-Aid off. That's exactly. what I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. Did anyone do uh, the open house extravaganza? I know we held like 17 open in all areas. This last one? Yeah. Yeah. I held one for Erica. I think nice. it was Erica. Yeah. Can't remember which property it was because I had done so many recently. <laughs> but yeah, I did. Like, it was fine. What house was that? No. <laughs> but it was fine. Well, she should be jumping on. Oh, no, that's not her. She should be jumping on any minute, guys. Thanks for hanging in there. How does the trunk retreat work for you guys? Is it just whoever wants to come sit at it or? Uh, yeah, we just have a sign up sheet. So any of our agents can do. Oh, there's Stephanie. I see her popping in down there. Oh. Um, our trunk retreat is just in our parking lot. And if you've been to the Medford office at all, we're in a parking lot of a big market center or there's like a movie theater and a bunch of shops. And so they all do a trunk or treat the same day. So we get a good amount of people through our office parking lot. So that's nice. So if your office doesn't have a trunk or treat set up, uh, try to do one or maybe um, think about this for next year and start planning one because it's a great way to get people through and introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Okay, as soon as Stephanie um, gets back, she we will uh, hand you over to her. She was there for a second and she ran. Are you ready? Yes. Mara's okay. helping me right now Perfect. to get this loaded. Hold on. Hello. Oh, to get your slides. Yeah, she's helping. Hi, Mara. <laughs> what do you mean? You want me to find your slides? <laughs> well, how do we do it? Because I like to go through it where they can see my screen or whatever. Technical difficulties today, guys. Sorry about that. It'll just, we're, we're going to be there in just a couple minutes.
so I guess I'll just keep talking about trunk or treat since that was the last thing we'll we were talking about. But um, so if you are interested in setting one up in your office, we can definitely uh, share some ideas and thoughts. Feel free to shoot me an email. Um, even if it's cutting it too close for this year, it's always nice as we go into business planning to map those things out and partner with either an ALC member or a, an agent that has a little more experience to start planning those. And it's really fun when you do it office-wide because you can make it so that you invite your um, your sphere. And then it also seems like all of those people are your clients and you know everyone. So your clients get to, to feel like you have a wider net of connection for them. Uh, so that's really fun to do. But it is a lot of prep. Well, I'm handing out candy bags. And so I'm doing it by myself. So I'm like, I'm prepping the bags by myself. So I'm like, might as well get my office involved. <laughs> next yeah, year do it all <laughs> get as many connections as you can okay it looks like stephanie's ready for you to get jump into win the seller so as soon as she unmutes you're all hers hi everyone okay i'm ready now so sorry um i had to give a presentation at my business group right before this so i i told mar i was going to be sliding into home so here we are um i'm super excited to be here with you guys today and to go over win with seller it's one of my favorite classes to teach and um you know i've been in the business now for 18 years and so i've um, gotten the opportunity to win with lots of sellers um and um, they're probably probably more of my favorite um group to work with as at this time um, in my career anyway. So um, since I'm kind of new at um, teaching, I haven't I haven't been um, your guys' teacher yet during this session. Um, how many of you, if you just want to raise your hands, have taken a listing yet? Okay. So, and, and I only ask this just because sometimes I kind of like to understand my audience. I mean, if you've all taken, you know, a bunch of them, then um, I might kind of tailor my presentation a little bit differently, but looks like we're kind of fairly fresh here and um, probably looking to get as much information as we can about, about working with sellers. So um, I want to make sure you guys can see my screen, correct? Yes. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. So, um going through all this. Okay. So I guess today, you know, we're going to kind of cover, you know, all of the aspects of working with a seller. Um, so from the start of just identifying, um, you know, a seller and how do you identify what kind of seller they are an A seller, B seller, C seller, um, and then how you might kind of make that determination, getting the appointment, the pre-listing packet, listing appointment, and then of course getting the listing agreement signed. And then of course, like what you would maybe do after that to continue to win with the seller. So um, stop me at any point if you have any questions and uh, we'll go from here. So um, Gary Keller says, well, leads are vital to your sales business. Seller listings are critical to your ability to build it to its highest level with the lowest cost and highest net. So um, what I would like to kind of say about that, and as you guys are kind of starting out, especially figuring out, you know, in your business, what kind of target group you want to work with, whether that be buyer or seller, or even if you're going to be even more specialized within those niches. Um, what I will tell you is that like, if you have the same client, let's say it's a buyer and a seller, right? And the goal with either of them is to get them to closing. Um, if I'm working with a buyer, you know, I'm going to likely have, can you shut that door? Mar, please. Thank you. Um, I'm going to likely have, um, you know, a buyer's consult presentation. So that's going to take probably about an hour. Um, they're going to, of course, now sign an agreement stating that they are going to be working with me. We are probably going to go look at homes um, in this market. You know, maybe we're going to look at 10 homes. I don't know. Once we get one under contract, then, you know, the period of time that I'm going to spend with them to get to closing, we're probably looking at, you know, there's going to be the time to negotiate um, the offer. We're going to get that negotiated. We're going to have inspections. That's going to be probably another hour or two. We're going to have repair negotiations. we got to get through the appraisal um, and then, of course, get to closing. So with a buyer, I'm probably looking at about 40 hours of work, let's just say, just prob probably somewhere, somewhere in that realm. Now, with a seller, I'm going to show up for the listing appointment. Um, 
And then, you know, I'm going to probably have pulled some comparables and do some research and stuff on the market. So let's say that that all total takes me about an hour and a half or so to do the appointment plus all my research. Then if they agree to work with me, then we're going to, of course, have, you know, pictures done and, um, you know, get the property listed. So that's maybe going to be another two hours or so. Um, and then during the course of my time, when I have that listing, you know, perhaps I might host an open house or two. Um, I'm going to be on the phone contacting my client. I'm going to probably send them some emails, but at the end of the day, the total time that I'm going to invest in that listing is maybe 10 hours versus the same type of client with a buyer. I'm going to go 40 hours. So if you're really going to maximize the time that you're going to be spending, um, in your real estate career, going for it, listings gives you leads with good leverage. And so ultimately that's going to be the better bang for your buck. If you're looking at working with buyers or working with sellers, sellers, um, a listing, if it's properly marketed and keyword there is properly marketed, then it should yield you according to the MREA, one new buyer and one new seller. So how that would work is if I listed a property and it was a good listing, I had my listing prepared correctly. I had good flyers. I had good marketing. I had good open houses, all those things. Then ideally I should be able to attract another seller, whether that be somebody that is in that neighborhood, or perhaps it is, um, you know, somebody that comes to like an open house or a buyer that calls me to look at the property that has a house to sell. Um, you should also be able to attract a buyer because statistically speaking, yes, Sophie. Sorry. Um, yeah. So it is less work, but would you say more money goes into listings? Like, cause you're marketing and do, do you think they're more expensive to uphold than a buyer would be? Good question. Um, so I mean, I think so, like if I were to look at just like, let's just say average listing. Um, so I'm going to probably spend, um, I'm going to spend some money on photography. So maybe let's say I'll just take an average, like $200 for photos. Now, sometimes it's only maybe 150. Sometimes if I'm going to go with a big luxury package, you know, with some crazy video, I mean, I could be approaching $600, but 200 is probably about a safe bet. Um, and I'm going to, I personally, I pay for somebody to put my signs in. So that's usually 35 to $40, depending on where it is. Um, so I mean, all in, I'm probably what, $250 or so. Um, and then, I mean, with, with a buyer, I guess the difference would be if I'm looking at my dollar per hour on like how much time I'm spending and then also like the gas to drive to all the different properties and stuff, you know, because it's like if I with a buyer, like sometimes you might get lucky enough that we're going to look at four houses today, you know? And so then that's really going to be, I'm going to leave my house one time and we're going to go out, we're going to look at four houses, might be gone for two hours or so. But most of the time it's a house today. And then, oh, this other one just came up. Can we see it on Wednesday? And so then the time that you're consistently having to leave to go show them, I think if you added up kind of like, you know, your gas and then your time and then kind of all those other maybe intangibles, you're, I mean, it's probably about equal. I mean, honestly, yeah. like, and then with the with the seller, like in addition to maybe my upfront fees of let's say $250 to get it on the market, I mean, if I'm gonna print flyers, right? So that I've got costs for that. Um I put my listing in a magazine, there's a cost for that. Yeah, right. Little things yeah. like that. Okay. And, and if you're paying for other, you know, I, you know, I don't pay for a lot of those other like services and stuff. I mean. Some, some of them I will just depends on what, what it is, but yeah, I mean, yeah. no, great question. I think, I think you're, I think the, the difference is that you're just going to, you're going to spend a lot more time with the buyer to get yeah likely the same amount of money, give or take. Yeah. I'm in escrow right now and we probably looked at like 15 houses yeah, with these right. buyers. Yeah. And it, like yeah. you said, it was like a Monday night and then we have to wait till they're off at five on Tuesday. They're off at five on Wednesday. It was that type of deal. So. Or the seller can't show it tonight and now we got to do it Saturday. And then, mm -hmm. you know, so it's so, you know, and I mean, for depending on people's situations, I mean, that can also. But my listing is 45 minutes out of town and it's just a piece of land. So that like, obviously yeah. it's just my very first listing. So that's why I was curious because I am going to pay for like a home warranty for my buyers. So that's money there and more time and effort and stuff as a buyer, but also like with my listing being 45 minutes out of town and to go out there and market it and stuff. It's, I was just wondering, I guess if it ever is less and it sounds like it, it, it is less. Yeah. I mean, I think it just depends on the situation, but I think ultimately like 
with a buy with a buyer too, you think about like your opportunities to get more buyers, right? If I have a buyer, right. I mean, I can't really market the buyer. When the buyer buys a house, I can say, oh, I sold a house to yeah. a low buyer. But with a listing, I mean, I have something to constantly promote too. Yeah. It's going to likely garner me, you know, other interested parties. So yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, okay. So we talked about that. All right. So a sellers, how do we identify an a seller? So they are ready, able, and willing to do business in the next 14 days. So next two weeks. So, um, I guess I would, the, what I would maybe add to this, um, with regards to like an a seller is I don't necessarily, I, I think you can quantify it by the amount of time they're looking to do business with them. And of course, per this it's 14 days. So two weeks, but I think the other thing is an a seller to me is somebody that's motivated, right? So I might have somebody that says, yep, I'm ready to list my house in two weeks. That's great. But um, let's say I think the house is worth 600 and they want to list it at 800. Well, then they're really not an A seller because they really don't have a driving factor of motivation of why they want to get that sold. To me, an A seller is somebody that has to sell for a particular reason. There is a timeline within which they need to get the property sold and like there's maybe something in their life going on that that is requiring them to need to transact um because you could have somebody that wants to sell kind of but they really don't have the motivation to do so it's kind of like yeah if it sells great if it doesn't it doesn't then i'm going to be to your point wasting a lot of my time my money my energy on a property that maybe when an offer comes in that is a reasonable offer, they're going to be unwilling to accept or negotiate so um an a seller not that we're looking for people that have you know something bad going on in their life, but, you know, maybe it, it is somebody that they found a house they want to buy and we have a time frame within which we have to sell our house to purchase it. We've got 30 days, we've got two months, whatever it is. So there's, there's the clock is ticking. Um, or it could be, you know, I've got other clients that they need to sell because they are moving out of state for a new job and they have to be moved to that state and start that new job by you know, December 1st or whatever the case may be. So in that case, they they have motivation and they have to do something by a certain date. Um, so the people that you would say are not really A sellers would be those that are kind of like, yeah, well, you know, we kind of want to put it on the market, see what happens. Um, you know, they don't really have a place that they want to go. They're not really sure what they want to do. Um, people that are an A buyer or seller are people that have to do something with a definitive time and there is a reason that they have to do it. Um, so that that's how I would I would quantify that. So now if you have a B or C seller, not to say you wouldn't work with them and put them on the appropriate follow up plan, you most certainly would. But I think that as far as when you're starting out who you need to get business from and how you need to get there, you want to work with the motivated because if you're spending time with unmotivated people, it's going to take you away from opportunities that are going to do business. So careful where you spend your time. Um, okay, what we talked about, three L's of MREA. So leads, listings, leverage. So kind of touched on this a little bit. So if I, again, like back to Sophie's point, if I have a listing, I have something to advertise and market. And I've got a couple different opportunities to be able to advertise and market it. So number one is, of course, when it is a brand new listing, I get to post that thing. Um, I get to, you know, talk about it, um, make videos, whatever I'm going to do. If there's going to be an open house um, or perhaps a broker tour, there's an, there's an open house opportunity to market it, market that I'm putting it on broker tour. I can market that we've had a price reduction. Um, there's all these different opportunities for me to be able to kind of, you know, uh, market that listing. Um, and when you have a listing, I mean, I would exploit the listing, right? Like do as much as you possibly can to get that out and in front of people and, um, you know, really show that, that you're doing something, especially as a new agent, because that I'm a realtor really doesn't send any messaging to your client or your database. But if you have a listing or something to talk about, then that is interesting. And it garners, you know, probably a little bit more engagement from your sphere. So if you have a listing to promote, promote the heck out of it. And then ideally, you will get a lead off of that listing. Now, again, like we talked about, when properly marketed, a listing should garner you another buyer and another seller. And we talked about the ways that that could happen. So either they show up at your open house or perhaps they call you on a sign call or from a you know, magazine that you advertised in or off of Zillow or wherever they get your information, that is a lead. So that lead 
and 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 I and remember this, right? Like if you get a phone call and somebody calls you about that, they want to buy a house or they want to do something, okay? You don't call Les Schwab and ask them how much their tires are if you are not interested in buying tires, okay? So don't ever discount somebody that calls you on your listing or your property as, oh, they weren't really interested. Oh, they were interested, right? You don't pick up the phone and ask somebody a question about something unless you're actually thinking about doing business, right? Okay, so think about that and then continue to follow up with that lead until it buys or it dies. Um, after you get that lead, what it does is it gives you leverage, right? And so we talked about how you're able to kind of spend your time maybe a little bit more wisely with a listing than with a buyer, because with a listing, you have it out as long as your marketing and everything is up, it basically stays up, right? You just kind of have to continue to promote it in certain ways, but it helps you to be able to leverage your time to get more listings or maybe work with some other buyers or whatever it is that you want to do. But that's kind of the three L's of leads, listings, and leverage. Uh, virtues of seller listings. Okay. looks like I kind of covered that. So um, more marketing opportunities. So yeah, you've got opportunities to market it when it's new, when you've got a price reduction, when you do an open house, uh, when you put it on broker tour. And even if it's stuff like, let's talk about broker tour. Okay. So broker tour is only for the real estate brokers to attend. So sometimes you might think, well, why would I why would I market that on my Facebook? Well, because you need to think about the people that are in your sphere or people that are that are looking at what you're doing, right? So if somebody sees that you're putting a property on broker tour and you're offering an incentive or you're, whatever you're doing with that, um, they might be talking to somebody that they work with, you know, in their job, their, their coworker who has their house listed. And guess what? Their agent is not doing a broker tour and their agent is not doing open houses and their agent is not doing this. So, you know, when that, person is frustrated and talks to their coworker at work about, well, my house isn't selling and nobody's looking at it. They might say, well, you know, I see my friend Ray over here and he's doing broker tour every week. And gosh, is your agent doing that? Well, no, my agent isn't doing that. So sometimes just by showing like what you're doing, you might end up getting yourself more leads and more business just because it's showing that you're engaged in the market and you're engaged in real estate and like other avenues of success, even if they're not going to garner you immediate, you know, your paychecks per se. Um, I think that you're consistently spreading the word that you are very, uh, you, this is your full-time thing. This is what you're doing all the time. And you're, you're very engaged in what, you, what you're doing here. You have more control of your time. Um, maximize your dollar per hour. So we talked about that. My dollar, I'm going to make basically the same amount of money if I work with a buyer or work with a seller. But of course, my dollar per hour on a seller is going to be significantly higher than it would be for a buyer. Um, more volume. Yeah. I mean, I currently, I think I have 21 active listings right now, just me personally. So I can have 21 active listings. It would be kind of hard for me to be able to work with 21 buyers that we're all wanting to buy in the next two weeks. Right. Um, and back to Sophie's point. Yeah. We can see one of them Monday night. We can see another one on Saturday. Like, I mean, you just, you lose a lot of track of your time. Um, to be able to service everybody at a really high level. Um, and it's also really hard to be able to find properties for that many clients. Whereas I can service on my own that volume of listings. It's, it'd be harder for me to service that volume of buyers. Um, seller listings, you're on the for, for front end of pricing. Yeah, I suppose, because you sort of set the market a little bit with that. Um, and then, of course, we talked about property properly marketed, and that's the key word here. Um, they will bring you more business. Um, service cycle. Okay. So we'll kind of go through this of, you know, con lead conversion to getting into your, um, consulting, your presentation, negotiating and contract to close. Um, well, I guess we'll go back. Any ahas? I thought it was interesting when you brought up the open houses, cause I don't have any home listings right now. So I do open houses for other agents Yeah, and I've come to... I've done open houses where they were very upset with their listing agent because they weren't doing open houses. And yeah. so that just kind of puts your name in the back of their mind. You know, you don't want to poach listings, but there are agents out there who don't do open houses. And it means a lot to clients to have open houses done. Absolutely. And I mean, I will tell you too, I mean, do the, the truth of the matter is, I mean, if I do an open house, do I think I'm going to sell that house? Absolutely not. No. What I am doing is it's giving me an opportunity to demonstrate to my seller that I'm doing something to sell their house. Right. Um, and I mean, I may also pick up a buyer and so that's cool too, but, um, and, and like, I mean, I've been doing this for a while. I mean, I probably have the 
level of business where I don't necessarily need to do open houses. I still do them just about every weekend. And um, I do that because it makes my sellers happy. I think my my competitors, a lot of times what they get accused of doing is they took the listing, they threw their sign in the yard. I have not heard from them ever since. And they're not doing anything to sell the house. And so that's why, I mean, I will do broker tours. I will do open houses. Uh, I call and check in with my client. Like, I mean, the, you, especially the market that we're sort of heading into right now, where inventory is sitting a lot longer than uh, it used to. I think that you kind of have to pull out all the stops and do the things, even if you don't think they're maybe going to make an impact. Um, yeah. You know, just do them because it, it helps to show your client that you're working hard. One thing that really stands out in my I'm in Klamath Falls so it's okay. kind of you know we're kind of hokey down here it's a smaller town um sure. so I'm and I'm 26 so I'm a younger agent in my okay. town too and so I make reels and videos of houses and stuff and it just okay. blows these agents away down here they just think it's so cool so I've actually had people just pay me to make these videos for them really so, yeah okay yeah. yeah so but just like putting yourself out there and just doing something new, you never know what it will bring you. That's what I've, that's my biggest aha with real estate probably. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I guess to that point, you know, what I would also think about um, with that is like, we, it sounds like you're helping out some other agents in your area too. Yes. Um, and so, you know, that, that is going to help you tremendously down the road. Um, because I mean, I have had many, a uh, transaction where my client, maybe we weren't the best offer. We weren't the highest offer, but because I had a relationship with the other broker, they would come to me and say, listen, I'd rather work with you than this other agent. Here's what they're offering. Can you, can you match that? And, and right. I have, and so right. by you helping to like solidify your relationship with those agents, um, I think that's going to help you in a lot of ways in the future, you know, to get your deals accepted. Um, yeah. I'm a transaction coordinator for Erica Abel. Do you know okay. her down here? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh -huh. She's helped me like immensely. If any of you guys could just ask a, a agent in your office, if they need a transaction coordinator, that would be life-changing. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's really great. And, and, you know, the real estate industry is, is kind of, is kind of weird, right? Because we rely on our competitors to do business with us. Right. Um, and so the, the, the odd thing is like, let's say if, if I went to the uh, BMW dealership and I test drove a uh, five series and I didn't, I didn't like it. That salesperson at BMW doesn't put me in the car and take me over to Mercedes so I can try a C-Class, right? But we do that in our industry. And so if they don't like our listing, we will go show them our competitor's listing. And so we are we are, we are are very much dependent on our competitors to do business with. So I think that's a great aha, you know, stay in their good graces, help them out and, you know, always, always have, you know, a good relationship with the other brokers yes. in the industry. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, next. All right, get the appointment. Converting your A sellers. Okay, so respond to your lead inquiries right away. So speed to lead, um, depending on where you're getting that lead. I think it really doesn't matter. But um, if it is somebody from your sphere, like somebody called you, they left you a message, whatever. Um, I mean, I think you need to get back to them that day. That is 100% for sure. But, um, you know, you probably have a little bit more grace with somebody that you know to get back to versus if this is like a lead from Zillow or something, um, speed to lead. I mean, I don't quote me on the statistical data here, but it's something like within like two minutes, they will shoot they're on to the next agent because they don't know you. They don't like you. They don't trust you. They're just looking for you to either open a door for them or to, um, you know, answer a question about something or, you know, they, they really don't care. They just would like their house on the market or they want to go see a house or there's, there's an immediate need that they're looking to have met. And so if you are not there speedy enough to meet that need, they will find the next agent that, that will answer that question for them. Um, now, somebody in your sphere, they probably already know you like you trust you. They've already decided that they think they want to do business with you. And so you probably have a little bit more leeway on how long you can get back to them, but you want to do that as quickly as possible, even if it's inconvenient, even if it's, you know, hey, I am in a meeting right now and um, 
can we schedule a time to talk at five o'clock today or something? You just want to make sure that you you hit them back with something and get them on, get them, book them on the schedule as fast as possible. Um, and I always tell like my team and stuff, our goal is to get in their living room. So um, even, even if I think that lead is not an A seller, like I think that, um, you know, maybe I, I have information about them. I know that now's not gonna be the right time for them to sell. Um, I really don't care. I would like to get into their living room because what I'm going to do there is I'm going to build rapport and I'm going to help strengthen my relationship so that when they are an A seller in six months or whenever that time period is going to be, that I am the one that they call because ultimately they want some questions answered right now. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that I'm in their living room and I'm the one that they continue to think of first whenever they are ready to do business. Um, get valid and complete contact information and save it to command as an opportunity. Um, yes, we'll go over that in a minute. And then, um, you know, determine their motivation to sell so you can speak to it. So in the initial, like, I guess we're kind of talking about here, like the initial sort of like phone call, um, if, if we're going to kind of role play, like how this might work and what questions I might ask, like if somebody, let's say, let's say they, they call or they text or whatever. Um, so again, number one, speed to lead, respond to that as soon as possible, either book them for a time to talk on the phone or book them for a time to go to their home and meet with them like as soon as possible. And you want to be the first agent there. Um, and you want to get in that door as quick, as quick as you can. Um, the things that I try to figure out on the phone, um, and I always do this like before I kind of like set up the appointment in my initial conversation, if I can, if I'm at my desk, I'm going to pull County records. So in our area, we have what's called Arlid now Klamath Falls, and I'm not sure where the rest of you guys are located, but you probably have some sort of equivalent. Um, I want to pull that up while I'm on the phone with them. And what I'm going to do while I'm on the phone with them is I'm going to go over some of the just basic details about what I'm seeing there. Okay, Janet, thanks so much for calling. Yeah, I'm really excited to, to talk to you about this. So you've got your house on 123 Main. Um, so I'm going to pull it up on Kenny Record while we're on the phone. And then I'm going to ask Janet some questions. So Kenny Record shows it's a three bedroom, two bathroom. Is that is that right? And then I'm going to hear what she has to say, yes or no. Um, and it says it's, you know, 1551 square feet. Does that sound about right to you? So what I'm doing in this conversation is, number one, I am confirming the information from County Record because it is important to make sure I know what I'm walking into. Because when I walk into that appointment, I want to have already pulled comparable sales and have at least an idea of, you know, what we're looking at. I'm going to be cautious about having like a, finalized number on there because I really don't know the condition of their home yet. But I'm I'm wanting to just verify like the details of the home because sometimes properties have been added on to. Uh, maybe it's not reflected in county record. I have seen county record be wrong uh, many a time. And so I just want to make sure like we're on the same page before I walk in that door. The second thing I'm doing is I'm trying to assess who am I meeting with? Are they in or a D, an I, a S, or a C. And I think you guys have gone over like the DISC personality profile. So when I'm asking these questions about, okay, and it looks like it's 1551 square feet. Does that sound about right to you? Three bedrooms. It's got, and then, and then I'll always ask, well, have you made any improvements to the home? So if they are a D, their goal is to get off the phone with me as fast as possible. They just want to set the appointment. They, they're done. They don't, don't want to talk to me anymore. Like, let's just keep rolling today. And I is going to be very excited. They're just going to be more happy to see me. And they're going to say, oh, we're so happy to have you. Uh, you know, I'll bake some cookies. And they're going to talk about the fun things we're going to do when I come over. Um, the S is going to answer those questions in a very timid fashion. They are very nervous. Uh, they are scared of change. Uh, they're not really sure how big the house is. Uh, they're just, they're kind of, they're kind of scared. They're going to talk softer. Um they're going to let you lead the conversation because they're very, they're very nervous about this process. A C is going to correct me. They're going to say it is not 1551 square feet. It is 1553 square feet. And um, they're, they're, they have to be right all the time. And so then they're also going to correct me about what year it was built. And they're going to correct me when I ask about improvements, they're going to be extreme specificity with what they tell me. They're going to tell me that, you know, it's a brand new 30-year um, architectural style shingle with this sort of pitch on it. I mean, they're going to they're going to get very specific about things. And so I want to know this because I'm going to tailor my presentation that we're going to do next to kind of meet who it is that I'm meeting with. 
So if it's a D, I'm going to still bring all the same information, but I know my goal is to be as clear, as concise. I better have my research done and I better have answers ready for them because this is going to be rapid fire. Boom, boom, boom. They're going to ask me the questions and I need to be able to fire right back. If I don't have the answers right, right then and there, then I'm going to lose that client. And I, I need to have the same information, but I need to understand that when I show up for that appointment, we are here to visit. This is social hour. We're going to have a drink. We're going to have some cookies. We're going to talk about the kids. We're going to talk about everything else except for their house until the very end when I'm like, yep, okay, so the reason I'm here is to talk about listing your house because they just, they just, they're friendly, they're excited. That's, that's kind of what's important to them is building rapport. The S, again, same information. I'm going to need to schedule more time for that person because they are going to be very nervous. Um, They're going to have a lot of questions. Um, they're just, they're just scared about the process and they just really don't even know what to ask, but they want somebody to hold their hand. So that's going to take some more time. Um, the C, uh, again, I better have, um, my materials printed and with, with me. Um, you also want to do that because again, the C is going to correct you. Um, and so you want to have the county records information and all of the data in front of you. I mean, and we're talking spreadsheets, we're talking graphs, um, because that's kind of their love language. So when I'm asking these initial questions on the phone, um, yes, I care about their answers, but I'm also trying to see how do they answer that question so I can determine what box to put them in and then win that presentation when I get there. Um, Determine the motivation to sell. So you want to ask them again, like I said, so the material says A sellers, they want to do something in two weeks. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. An A seller, I think, is somebody that has a definitive deadline by which they have to do something. So that's what I'm trying to get to. And and not to like super pry, but like, okay, well, well, what happens if you don't sell? Have you considered renting out the house? You want to find out like, are they looking into other avenues and like, what else could they do if we can't sell the house? Because that's also going to tell you how motivated they are. Um, and then, you know, usually I'll say, is there a timeline within which that you need to um, sell within. And then that'll usually get them to open up about, well, yeah, gosh, my new job, it starts in Tennessee and I have to be there by this date or um, the babies do, you know, by this date, we really have to get moved, you know, or whatever it is that's pushing them to make this decision, they're going to reveal to you. Um, The other thing right now that I would just, you know, kind of, kind of also be leery of and like talk about, um, you know, most people, if they're sitting in their homes right now, and I, and I think statistically speaking, 40% of people that have mortgages have them under 3%. So if they are thinking about making a move right now, then they're going to trade their 3% rate for, let's say, six and a half. So they're going to be spending at least $1,000 more a month, just in interest alone to make that move. Um, So I would really press them for what is causing them to want to do this. Because most of the time right now, if I look at my sellers, and I've got a whole board full of them right here I'm looking at, um, most of them have something going on in their personal life. It is death, divorce, going into assisted living, bankruptcy. There is some sort of personal reason promoting them to want to make a move. And right now, most of the time, it's not pretty. So I would kind of press them a little bit harder because again, that might be information that you may need um, on the other end of things when um, you know, you're kind of in negotiation. And And what I'm talking about there is like, so there are some people that have got a lot of debt. Um, and so you kind of want to have that information up front so that you can make sure you're pricing the home at a place where you can still sell it and get them clear um, of those obligations. Um, and so a lot of times these questions are are kind of critical to making sure that you list the house at an appropriate price they can actually sell for. Um, the last thing that I always do in this initial phone call is I confirm who's on title. Um, And so a couple different examples here. Um, Again, in my perfect scenario, when I have this phone call, I have county record pulled up or I have the ability to pull it up like on my phone or something when I'm talking to them. Um, And I want to always ask them like, okay, so are, you know, who, who needs to be there? Cause I want to present to both parties um, that, have the ability to sell the house. Um, The last thing you want to do is go meet with one spouse and not the other one, because that other one might actually be the decision maker and you just didn't realize that. And so then your presentation is going to go, you know, filtered and they're going to repeat it wrong. And so you just want to make sure all decision makers are present at the time that you have that in-person meeting. Um, The other thing is sometimes there will be people on title that, um, 
you didn't you didn't realize we're going to be a, a party to this. So that could be like, let's say a parent co-signed for a child, right? And the child calls you and they say, okay, I'm ready to sell the house. Well, I noticed so-and-so is on title. Who is that? Oh, that's my dad. Okay, great. Well, we need dad in the room too, because what you don't want to do is go present to the kid. And then dad actually has to sign off on all this and find out he's got his realtor buddy that's been his best friend for 25 years. And that's really who they're going to use. Right. Um, or sometimes in divorces, um, a lot of times people in their divorce decree, it is spelled out who gets the house. That's great. But unless they actually went down to the title company and usually did a refinance and then took that other person off title, maybe that one spouse was awarded the house, but the other spouse still has to sign off on it. Um, and so sometimes that can get very tricky because I've had people who divorced 10 years ago, they thought they got this taken care of, unbeknownst to them, they did not. And so we actually do now have to track down the other spouse and get them to sign off. So it's always important to ask those questions up front. Um, the last one would be somebody that's deceased. So a lot of times you'll have, and again, in the market we're in, most of the time people are not selling right now for happy reasons. So there may be somebody that is either deceased or they're in assisted living or something. So you want to kind of uh, find out, okay, well, great. I'm Eleanor. Thanks for calling. I see James is on title two. Who is, who is James? Oh, it's my husband. Okay. And is he still living? No, he's not. Okay. Well, in that case, you know, what they do have to have is they have to have the original death certificate to present to the title company, and it must be the original. So again, things that you want to kind of go over up front and make sure that they're prepared for. Um, I've had this happen before. Probably one of the worst situations was there was like five kids. We were selling the parents' house. Um, we did have to produce a original death certificate and one kid thought the other one had it. They thought the other one had it. Anyway, nobody could find the original. So we had to contact DHS. We didn't know about this until, you know, the very end of the transaction. Well, they said it was going to be a six-week wait time to get a new original mailed to us. And so anyway, it ended up really delaying our transaction. And so had I known to ask those questions up front, I think, you know, things would have gone a little bit smoother. But unfortunately, we were at, you know, the mercy of DHS to get this taken care of. And so it's always important on the front end to kind of figure out who who's in who's in power, who needs to sign, who do I need to have in that room when I'm presenting to and get there as soon as possible. Um, okay. So Stephanie, what are the I have a question. Yeah. You say you pull up county records. Mm -hmm. Um, I was told to ask the title company for CSP. Is mm -hmm. that the same idea? Same thing. Yeah. Okay. And um so I guess, okay, so here's my thoughts on that. So like you're, we're not in the same county. So I'll speak to Lane County. So we have what's called RLID here. And I imagine you have an equivalent. Um, or I know like First American Title has like My First AM, Western Title has some, I mean, all the title, a lot of times they have an app, like you can pull stuff up on, or even through RMLS, I know you can hit the tax button and then see there. Um if I can, I try to do that on my own or have some way or some service that I subscribe to, free or otherwise, um, to get that data. Uh, because what I don't want to do is have to call my title rep and then it's two or three hours before they get me that information. And you know what I mean? So if there's right. a way I can pull it up on my own, I, I really enjoy that. Now, after I've done that and I'm like, then, then I probably would call and request that type of report. Okay. Okay. But I like to have whatever I can in front of me. Yeah. And for like in a pinch situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what do they want from their agent? Okay. Well, it looks like according to this profile of buyers and sellers, um, they want you to help them price it. They want you to market it, um, sell it in a specific time frame. Yep. And then help find ways to fix it up or sell it for, for more. So um, I guess I would say with regards to this, it's interesting that 27% is other. So you have to wonder, well, what is other? Because that's actually kind of a, that's the, that's the biggest uh, uh, chunk here that we have kind of undefined on this little graph. Um, so, I mean, I think ultimately what the sellers want is most of the time, there is a problem they are trying to solve and that's why you're here to solve it. So whatever they want is going to be different for each person. For some people, it is, I just need to get this thing sold because I don't have money to make the next house payment. Or for other people, it is, I have to get it sold because we have to move to Nebraska and we have to be there in 30 days. Or 
uh, I, you know, I had another one recently where they went into assisted living and they needed the money to cover her medical costs. So really what they want from you is they want you to help them solve whatever problem it is that has presented itself. So I think, again, that's why in that initial consultation, it's so important to ask those questions and just kind of figure out like, okay, who are we dealing with? What are we dealing with? And why is this so critical that you get this sold right now? Um, and and then kind of tailor your, how you do things sort of from, from there. Um, and I do think obviously help them to market it and do all these other things too. But I think really just be in relationship with your clients and know what it is that they need and then just help them to get there. Just solve that problem. Build confidence and trust. Okay. Yep. So Did you guys just lose her? I think so. I thought I was the only one that was frozen. Oh, okay. it's well, check. are we back? We're back. Oh, I think we're, yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but we can't see you. Hello? Are you, can you see me now? Yeah, we yeah. can see now, you. Yeah. Hi. Okay, we're back. Uh, <laughs> that was funny. Cool. Weird, weird. Um, okay, so this slide, I hate it. Um, Personally, so seven close to appointment tactics. So you've got. We can't see so, the slide. We can see you, but we can't see the slides. Hold, please. Okay. I'm not sure, but there's like a share button right in the middle. It's like a green one. Maybe that's like the screen share, maybe. Yeah. Can you see it now? We can see it now. Okay. Can you see me? Yeah, we can see both. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh weird. I don't know what happened there. Um okay. So this slide. I hate it. Um I think there's all these like sales tactics, right? Of the take back close, the trial close, the assumptive close, tie downs, that sort of thing. Um, and I'm sure they've probably gone over this with you. Again, I mean, my big thing is I would rather just have a good relationship with my client, understand what it is that they want, and then do everything I can to help them to get there. Um, and so I don't really use a lot of this salesy stuff. Um, I mean, I guess there have probably been times where I've had a seller that I know that they have to get out of this house. And sometimes they'll fight you a little bit and they'll just get a little bit, I don't know, upset because they didn't get the offer they wanted or the process is kind of fatiguing to them or whatever the case may be. So sometimes I maybe might pull out this sort of like, okay, well, I guess, I guess we can just, you know, terminate the offer then. I mean, that's fine. And then no, 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 we don't do that. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. Um, but most of the time, like I, I would never, you know, try to play games with them in this way, but sometimes, yeah, like I'll, I will, um, you know, if they're, if they're making decisions and negotiations that I think are going to cost us the deal, then I will kind of go down that road with them and say, okay, well, what, what happens if, uh, you know, the buyer walks away after we don't take their repair done to them? What happens if that happens? Oh yeah, no, I really have to sell the house. No, we really can't lose the buyer. Okay, well then, you know, and sometimes that gets them back on track, but um, I don't usually use these tactics. Um, questions versus objections. Okay, so especially when you're new, here's what I would say. The definition of a professional is somebody that knows what they do, knows what they don't, and they know the difference between the two. So when you're new, your clients know that you're new. They know that you haven't done a lot of deals. So if you know the answer to a question, then give them the honest answer. If you don't, don't make something up. Just tell them you don't know and you're going to find out. And then go on a quest to go figure out the answer to that question and then come back educated with all kinds of information for them and go from there. Um, what I would not do is, you know, kind of try to make things up and that sound good, but maybe not aren't really the right answer. Um and, you know, especially for me, when I started, I was 18 and um, there's a lot of things I didn't really know, but I would kind of over prepare for all my appointments and kind of do probably a lot more research than I really needed to do. Um, and I think that that really helped to set me apart. Um, and it also helped me to gain quite a bit of education about what I needed to do um, moving forward because, 
you know, I ended up kind of on those little tangents, learning a lot more about things than maybe I really needed to. So, um, when an objection comes up, ob address it. And I think honestly, I will kind of try to, um, you know, be proactive about, well, what objections do I think are going to come up? And now some of this has probably come with my experience, right? But a lot of times, like even before, and I'd recommend this, like one, one thing that I am thinking that comes to mind right now, um, is with objections that that may come up like before when we get an offer like even and even when we're listing it I will always have the title company or one of the apps I use like I use Fidelity Agent prepare a net sheet that's going to show them exactly what they're going to net out of that sale if they sell for x amount of dollars and so um, a lot of times that that kind of helps up front because like let's say they sell for 450 well they might only be getting like 407 right after it's all said and done um, and then of course you got to deduct you know the amount that they owe on the property and that kind of thing so a lot of times from the very beginning i like to go in like with all that information and numbers up front and that way there's just no surprises and that's going to help you to not have the type of objections that you might get. So I personally use Fidelity Agent, um, depending on where you're at, your title company probably has a similar um, type of an app that you can generate net sheets on. I think they're incredibly helpful um, and it really helps to show the breakdown to the client of exactly what number um, they need to get to. The other type of objection that um, comes to mind to me right now to think about maybe looking into before you get into this um, sort of situation would be sometimes I might, uh, encourage my client to do an inspection on the home prior to listing it. Um, and if it's like, if the property has a well or a septic on it, then I typically will always recommend those upfront because I will tell you the number one question I'm going to be asked by a buyer is, oh, there's a well. Well, do we know what kind of flow it has? And nope, we have no idea. <laughs> um, isn't, isn't a great answer. So, um, a lot of times since that is going to be something they have to do regardless, I will encourage them to do that up front. Um, and then inspections, I mean, there's kind of two schools of thought on that. But sometimes, and again, I bring this up because I think the majority of transactions that you will be working with at this time because of the market are people that, you know, death, divorce, going into assisted living. So a lot of times you're dealing with a trustee or a child that, you know, it wasn't their house, but you're dealing with somebody that's making decisions on behalf of the owner. And so a lot of times they have literally no information. Um, and so getting an inspection ahead of time is going to help you and them and the family and whomever is involved in this process to really understand the extent of um, repairs and deficiencies of the home so that you can price it appropriately. Because the worst thing you want to do is go in with your comparables and say the house is worth 500000 And then um, a great one that I just had similar situation. Um, you know, the daughter was from Roseburg. The house is up here. It was her mother's home. Mom went to assisted living. Um, I encouraged them to get a home inspection and we did. Uh, we had a lot of foundation issues. Um, and the bid that we received for those was $105,000 just for foundation. Um, and then we had a new roof, new chimneys, new, all sorts of things. And so the grand total of everything that was needed to just, you know, kind of correct the property was about 150,000. So the initial 500 I quoted her really wasn't a great number anymore, but it was good to have that information up front before we listed it because then everybody was on the same page as to why we were going to discount the property. Um, and then we did end up getting it sold and, and quickly and everybody's happy, but, um, you know, in those situations, it, it might be good to encourage, um, them to, you know, do some of that, up front so that, you know, you can kind of save headache later and also some disappointment. Uh, ahas. Um, just a story. My fiance and I, we just bought this house <coughs> that we're in and we got the septic inspected and it was completely crumbled, totally rooted out. So the sellers, it becomes a disclosure issue at that point. So they had to pay for it and completely replace it. And it just added a week or so onto our uh, closing date. So it would have been nice if their listing agent had suggested that they at least look into the septic tank before listing it. Yes. Well, yeah. And that is a great, great example of something like that. And like a septic, those are things that, you know, um, people just never, they don't, they don't, inspect them. You know, you have a septic and it's in your yard and you know that 
you flush your toilet and you think everything's fine. But a lot of times there's a lot of those issues that are, that are lurking and they will be thousands of dollars to rectify. Um, and people just don't have any idea about that. So, um, I think that that, it, and it's one of those things with septic or well, like you're going to have to get it done regardless in the transaction. So doing it up front is often a better. Um, yeah. Like when we go to sell, we'll probably, we'll do it up front. We'll get yeah. it out of the way and just have it as a report. Yeah. And I, and I think too, depending on the situation um, with my sellers, what I tell them about why, so it's a, it's a, it's a bad idea to get information because then you have to disclose that information. So sometimes mm -hmm. sellers don't want to do inspections because right. you're giving them knowledge, which they then have to disclose. Now, I think it's good to get that information because then what I can do is when we have a buyer, the buyer comes along and I can give the buyer the whole home inspection, the septic report, the well report, everything. And I've given them all the information about the house, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then they're going to make their offer based upon what they know are the deficiencies of that home. So it makes it very difficult for them to then come back 10 days later and say, I want more discounts on the price because of these issues. Well, no, you knew about those issues when you made the offer that you made. And so therefore negotiations are going to cease and this is the price you'll be paying. So it gives you a lot more, I think, leverage with buyers um, if you are able to present that up front. And it's, it's, it, unless there's something new that they found out about, nope, you knew about all the things that were here and they were here two weeks ago and you made your offer. So I, I do feel like the whole like knowledge is power thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in my, so the one I was just telling you about too, I mean, we really didn't know what we didn't know. You know, the daughter hadn't really been to the house. I mean, you know, her, her father's been passed away for many years. Mom was there. Um, unfortunately, mom's, you know, mental faculties weren't really there. So she wasn't really one we could ask about repairs. And then unfortunately we found, you know, a considerable amount and, and the, we, you know, were able to press the property appropriately. So, uh, pre-listing packet. Okay. So. I don't really do one to just be honest with you. Um, I know some agents do, and I guess here's the good and here's the bad with them. So the good is you're able to present a packet, um, up front to say all the things that you're going to do, um, to sell that house. Um, and maybe your value proposition, which I think is important. Um, and then maybe some information about the house. So where this is good is I think it probably comes across as though, you know, you've prepared for the appointment, which is good. Um, you have information, you've got some things that are some printed materials. I think that makes it look good, look polished. That's all great. But where I think this can kind of pigeonhole you and get you into some trouble is sometimes you um, hand that report to a client and then there might be something in your pr proposition that they don't like. Um, and so I'll give you an example. So I recently met with a seller and this was kind of funny um, to me that she said this, but um, normally what I will do with my listings is I will always do, um, you know, professional photography. And then with that comes like the Matterport tour. Um, so that 3D tour, and then also like a floor plan. And so I think those are really valuable tools um, to sell the house, especially for out of town clients that want to take a look at, you know, what this might be before they come here. Um, and, uh, especially the Matterport is really cool. Cause they can kind of virtually, you know, tour the house and, and what, whatnot. Um, so this seller, uh, it was very funny. She was adamantly opposed to me doing any sort of 3d or floor plans or anything like that, because she said she read an article on the internet about how people were um, using these to steal from people, like using the um, 3d tours to kind of see, you zoom in and see what they had in the house or where it was located and where the doors are to case the house and then steal. And so she did not want that done. She said, I only want some still photos. That's what I want. So I guess what I'm saying is if I, if I had given this woman a pre-listing packet that talked about, I do all those things. She probably wouldn't have hired me because she would have thought, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want the 3D tour. If I go with Stephanie, I'm going to get the 3D tour. I don't want I don't want to do that. That's that's not what I want. Um, so the fact that I was able to kind of talk with her first, then when she said, no, but I'm really I'm really worried about this. I OK, no problem. We don't have to do a 3D tour. Not a not a big deal. Saves me money. But um, I, I disagree with her. I think they're useful. But, you know, you just never kind of know what sort of hot buttons people are going to have. Um, open houses, another, another thing. So if you had on your pre-listing packet that you are going to do an open house, there's some sellers that don't want them at all. They're very, I have, I have one client that, um, the neighborhood she lives in is kind of a, uh, 
I don't know, just a gossipy neighborhood. And so she really didn't want the open house because she thought, well, all the neighbors are going to come through and she has some weird relationships with different people. And so that was a big hot button for her. So again, if I would have given her a pre-listing packet that defined I was going to be doing something like this, that would have probably been offensive to her, um, not a benefit. And so I would just be careful what you put in there um, and don't make it too, too generic um, too. And, you know, it also depends on the property that you're listing. Like I've got a pig farm listed right now. Well, the type of marketing and what I will do for that is going to be different than, you know, a condo, right? And so I think just just don't get too excited to make this packet and hand it out to everybody. Just make sure you're remembering what's in it and how that might come across to different clientele. Um, the other thing with the pre-listing packet, um, I think that you want to be careful about dropping things off or letting anybody know you're coming over for the listing appointment um, because you kind of don't maybe always know who knows about the listing. Um, so for instance, let's say it was a rental property and you didn't realize it was a rental property and you dropped off a listing pre-listing packet and the tenant got that before the owner had time to tell them that they were thinking about selling the property. You probably have just caused a big problem, you know, between um, the landlord and the tenant. Um, or I have a seller right now that's called me and is wanting to sell the house um, for financial problems, but he has not yet told his wife that they're going to do this. So what I would not want to do <laughs> is drop off my packet and um, let that be the conversation starter. So sometimes you just want to, again, I think it just boils down to the relationship that you have with your client and making sure that they know that you're there for them. You're happy to help them to solve whatever problem it is that selling the house is going to solve. Um, and But also just make sure you understand the situation and don't get too caught up in trying to be salesy and drop off packets and balloons and all kinds of things when maybe we don't totally have a grasp on um, the situation just yet. Um, okay, E to P. Yep, entrepreneurial to purposeful. So um, I think that this, if you guys do anything, I would highly recommend you read the MREA book, Millionaire Real Estate Agent. Um, a lot of the stuff, you know, you go through in there, but it really just talks about when you're entrepreneurial, which is probably where most of you are starting out right now. Um, you know, you got into this industry for a reason um, and probably for everybody it's different, but it's a very entrepreneurial and, and then you will you will certainly hit a level of natural achievement where then you really have to get systems and stuff in place in order to take your business to the next level. You can do so much on your own and then you eventually will get burnout and you'll just kind of keep hitting your head on this ceiling here. Um, and so that's when you're going to have to, you know, try to implement models and systems. And then that's what's going to help you to break through the, to the next level. And then guess what? There's going to be another ceiling and you're going to have to break through. And, um, you know, right before you break through, there is always breakdown. So just know that if you are having a really crappy day and you cry yourself to sleep and things are going really bad, that you're probably on the cusp of being able to break through to that new level. And a lot of times it takes this, this hard time to, to be able to understand that. So keep going. Uh, pre-listing packet goals. Okay. So again, I think we talked about that. Like I would probably state your value, talk about your experience, that sort of thing. Again, I'd be careful. I wouldn't pigeonhole yourself. And also I wouldn't put a lot of specific things in there. Cause I think again, sometimes, um, that can maybe lose the listing more than win the listing. Um, and then also pre pre-listing packet, I would again, be careful about who and where you're dropping it off and just making sure that, whatever, whoever you're giving it to, they, they have signed up for this. Um, and, and they know, they know that this is happening. Um, do you review it in your presentation? Does it eliminate the need for a consultation? Um, you know, again, my personal opinion, like I'm going to try to get as much information on the phone ahead of time. I'm going to go back to the office. I'm going to prepare really hard for that appointment. And then I'm going to show up for that appointment. And really, um, while I'm going to be prepared with data and information about what I intend to do to get the home sold, um, I, it's really about the relationship. And it's, and I think that's really where you're going to when you're listing is you're just showing them that you truly do care about whatever situation that they're in and what they're trying to do. Um, and that you have a plan to get them there. And I think in times of uncertainty, people want to be told what to do. Um, so they do want, while, the, while they want to kind of be in control, they, they really want a professional that's going to help them to get them to the other side. Um, and so I really think that's probably the biggest thing. And most of that, I mean, giving them a pamphlet about this is not sincere. So I would probably lean more towards 
getting in their living room and having a conversation. Um, and, and you, you want to be somebody they feel like they can pick up the phone and call and talk to. Um, and I, and I think a pamphlet or a piece of literature doesn't do that. You know, I think it's really the relationship. So that's probably where I would weight heaviest on making sure you win, you know, the listing. Um, I do know if you want to prepare one and I don't think it's a bad idea to do it. Um, there's a bunch of, um, these types of, uh, resources inside KW connect and online. So I would totally recommend, you know, downloading those and, um, you know, kind of putting your own touch on them and customizing them. And that way, at least you do have something to, to hand out. Um, consultation pre preparation checklist. Okay. So I think we covered most of this. I mean, deliver your packet, depending on if you do or don't, that's up to you. Um, confirm the appointment date, time, and location. So, um, sometimes I, depending on how far out we schedule it again, my goal is always to schedule as soon as possible. So sometimes I'm, there's not going to be a confirmation because it's the next day. So I'm probably not going to call them and confirm the next day. If it's like a week out, yeah, I'll probably call the day before and just, hey, just wanted to double check. We're all good for tomorrow um, and confirm. I think that's not a bad idea. Um, ensure all decision makers attend. So yes, we talked about that and why that would be important. You don't want to be giving a presentation to one party to find out that the other party was actually the one that was really probably in charge of this whole thing. Um, and then also find out if any are deceased or, you know, why they might not be attending. Um, and then practice your listing presentation. I would definitely recommend doing that. Um, I would prepare, 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 like do as much as you can on the front end before you get into that living room. And I mean, I'm talking about, um, you know, maybe driving by some of the comparable sales. If you can go look at the active listings, um, you know, when I was new, we did not have Ignite. We had what was called Camp 443. Um, and it was four listings and four sales in three months. And so it was a similar type of thing that you guys are going through. But one of the um, things we had to do each week was we had to tour 20 houses. So in our area, we have broker tour. I've mentioned that a couple of times. I would use broker tour as my opportunity to go and tour the houses because that's the day that you can you know, tour them without having to have an appointment. And um, so that's, you know, a way to go into houses that are occupied or, or what have you. Um, and so anyway, what I found was, in the, even though it seemed like maybe it wasn't that important or kind of trivial, um, after I toured the house, I would have, you know, I would know about that house. And so I never knew when six months later, I might be sitting in somebody's kitchen, talking to them about listing their house and I had just toured their neighbor's house, you know, a couple months earlier on the broker tour. And so it really kind of gave me more, um, you know, talking points and more familiarity with the competition that maybe I would then be using in my market analysis report. So I wouldn't discount some of the things that you think are kind of like, oh, what is that for? It's not going to get me anywhere today. Well, it might not, but it might give you knowledge that you're going to need or will be happy to have in six months. So I don't think it's ever a bad idea to like go out and do broker tour, go to open houses, familiarize yourself with inventory. Because then what I found is if I had done that, then when I was presenting a market analysis report, then I had some more information about why that comparable maybe sold for less or sold for more because I had toured it. So I could say, well, you know, the reason why this one, you know, didn't sell for as much is because, you know, I, I actually went there, I toured it on broker tour and, you know, they had seven cats and two ferrets and it smelled really bad, you know? Um, but some of that stuff you wouldn't be able to tell, um, you know, from the MLS or just the comments that you're reading there. But because I had toured it, I was able to give that feedback or on the converse, I could say, well, yeah, it sold for 50,000 more because it had this really great walk-in shower and it had, um, you know, all these other, you know, updates, the yard, they had this beautiful pond and it was landscaped and all this other stuff, you know? And so again, if I hadn't have gone out and actually toured those, then there probably would be a little disconnect between, um, you know, the information that I had that I was able to, to share. So I would do that. Um, and then complete and practice your presentation. Yes. Review your lead sheet. I use a lead sheet. I mean, I think now most people are doing things on the computer, so I probably would default to more something like that. Um, but on my lead sheet, you know, I basically just have information about, you know, contact information, um, information about why they're selling. Like when you're starting out, you probably don't necessarily need to have as much of this there because you probably don't have, you know, 50 sellers you're working with. Um, 
when you scale, then you do want to have something like that because it's important for you to look back and see, oh yeah, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, that's why they're selling. They're getting divorced. Okay. I'm going to remember that. So something like that, where you can kind of record those types of information and then arrive to the listing presentation in a professional manner. Okay. So yeah. So be early. Uh, don't show up late. Uh, have a clean car, have your, you know, pad folio or whatever it is that you're going to bring in, um, ready to go. I actually, um, just show you right here, have these folders I bring and, um, I have a label maker right here. And so even if I have nothing in the folder, it's like a prop, right? So when I show up to the listing appointment, I bring this big old legal folder here. Um, I have in here printed off and put in here like the county records information. Um, I have my lead sheet right here on the front, which does have me go like, you know, are they happy, sad, date to go on the market? What's their disc profile, that kind of thing. Um, and so, and then, you know, on some other, I have, you know, county records information here. So this is like how we do it here. So really like, yes, I use this and yes, I do keep their stuff in here, but it's kind of more of a prop. And I honestly think if you show up with something like this, even if it's just you used a label maker and made a label on a file, it shows that you prepared for that appointment. Even if there's nothing really exciting in your folder, um, I think it helps to lend credibility to who you are as an agent and that, that you did prepare. You're not the one that showed up late, didn't have anything, had a notepad, didn't really take notes, right? So I would recommend a prop or something of that nature will, will help. Ahas. Okay. Uh, listing appointment. Okay. So this is, this is where we want to be. We want to be in their living room. Um, so, okay. So I think, yes, goal is to get a, a listing agreement signed. Um, I think even if, even if they're like, nope, we're a month out, I would still have them sign it that day or as soon as you can. Um, because what you don't want to have happen is we've given them too much time to think about this if it's a month out. And you've also given them time to talk to their coworkers or their friends or their neighbors and somebody else might swoop in and buy that property if you don't have it under contract. So I think it's important to get the paperwork signed and that way you will have, you know, um, kind of nailed down that, that listing. Um, I think you do want to share your price recommendation um, and like your reasoning for where you came from with that. But I would be cautious in your listing appointment. I would try to figure out all the background information of, again, why it is that they're wanting to sell. Why are you here today? What are their goals before you really go into your pricing strategy? Um the other thing is like, I, like I've told you prior to this, like in the initial phone call before we even get to this step, I'm trying to confirm all the information about the house. And I likely will have already pulled comparables, driven by some of the active ones, like really looked into, you know, my pricing. Um, in addition to that, I always look at Zillow and Redfin too. Now I don't look at those because I think they're accurate. I look at them because I know that my seller did before they called me. So I want to know, well, what does Zillow say and what does Redfin say? And then what, what was my analysis? Because if it's very different, I just kind of want to be armed with that information. So I have the ability to combat it in that conversation uh, when we go over that. And sometimes we're spot on, but sometimes we're off. But it also usually helps me to get an idea of what what number do they think I'm going to tell them, you know? Because um, I want to know that too. Because I want to know if I'm going to come in with like great news and they're going to be like, oh my gosh, it's worth that much. I had no idea. Or if they're going to be really disappointed with the number that I'm giving them. Um, and if I think they're going to be disappointed, then I again want to be armed with additional information information to support the numbers that I'm I'm coming up with. So that's kind of why I I am I tr tread lightly around that and and again I try to figure out why are we here. Um and then my recommendation might be a little bit different based upon what their timeline is. Like if it is a property and they are like going to foreclose and we have a foreclosure date in two months, then the number I'm going to give them is probably going to be lower than if this is a, yeah, we have to sell, but we really don't have to be there for six months. 
because I know that if I don't get them out of this in that time frame and we have a short window to do this, then they're going to lose everything versus if I have more time to to get them there. So again, that's why I want to talk. I want to really hone in on motivation. What is it we're trying to accomplish? What timelines do we have before I give them, you know, that final price? Um, setting expectations for how you'll market the home. Yes, I think we should do that. But again, I think this is a partnership. So again, back to the lady that doesn't like her neighbors and doesn't want to open houses. I want to maybe not talk so much, right? And just kind of hear, well, what what kinds of things, you know, would, would you guys like to see? Is there anything you don't want me to do? Because um, that all kind of comes out. And, you know, for different people, sometimes it's funny, weird things that just, you know, we wouldn't necessarily think of. But to them, it's like a huge deal. Um you know, or maybe um, like I've got some people, they've got little kids and they've got nap times at certain times. And they don't want showings then like to them. That's the most important thing about this process. Right. Like you just want to talk to them and figure out, OK, what what is really important to you and what's not important to you? And that way you can kind of tailor your presentation and what you guys decide together to do, um, you know, to, to make the best use of their time. Because you really your goal is to get their home sold, but your goal is also to make them really happy so that they're raving fans and that they refer you business. And so I think the way to make that, um, you know, go as smoothly as possible is just, you know, to really understand like what's what's super important to that person. So. Um, how the listing presentation meets sellers needs and wants okay so I think we talked about that like again I think it's really just talking to them and finding out what what it is and I really I would probably do that before in your presentation you start delving into what you're going to do or what you're not going to do because um, sometimes you'll have just lost them and you and it might be something really silly like 3d tours right where you think that's a great thing but your seller is like scared to death of you doing that so that's why I think just having a conversation and then you talk afterwards is maybe the way to um the way to go about it. So what I do like at the listing presentation, let's say, is um, I arrive on time. I have my uh, my my props with me here. Um, and then I usually ask them to take me on a tour of the home. And so I let them tour me around the home because, again, I'm going to help determine in this time, you know, what um, type of personality they are and what it is that's important to them. So again, how they tell me about the details and or if they rush me through or if they go really slow, that's going to help me determine if they're a D and I, S or a C and how I should conduct the rest of the appointment. So um, we go tour through the home. And, um, and, and so I want to do that because I want to, again, figure out who they are. But I also like you what you wouldn't want to do is give them, start start your meeting and give them a number. And then they take you to the back of the house and you see that there's black mold and they're, you know, breeding chihuahuas and, you know, I mean, whatever, right? Like you want to make sure that you've seen the property before you start spouting out numbers. So I think that's the other reason why you really want to, um, you know, talk to them first, see the property in that meeting, and then let's go over what, what our plan of action is here. Um, so after I see the property, then usually we will sit down either in the living room or dining room. Um, if you are going to sit, well, sit anywhere, you want both of them in front of you. So do not sit in the middle of the party. So like don't sit at the head of the table with one on each side because then they can look at each other. You want to be able to look at both of them directly and make eye contact with both of them so that you can ascertain who's making decisions here. And then you can kind of see their body language about what, what you said, what was a problem, what was not. So make sure that how you position them in the home for this next part of the meeting, um, you do it with some strategy. Uh, as you're kind of going through that, you know, you probably have at this point picked up on what needs to be done with the house. If there's any renovations or things that have to happen before you think it's good to list. Um, and then you know, you've probably also hopefully picked up on what type of personality they are um, and how you should be talking to them for this next segment of the appointment. Um, and then also kind of what's going to win with them or or lose with them. So usually um, I'll have my comparables and so I'll kind of bring them out one by one. I don't start by saying your house is worth 500,000. No, I will take out all the comparables one by one. We will go through each of them, right? Because what I'm doing is I'm building a case. We're going to do it slow and steady here. So here's the house number one. Okay, so this house is three bedroom, two bath. It's 1,500 square feet. It was built in this year. And so I basically am going to go through all the data so that they can sit there and say, yep, 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 it is. And then we're going to together agree that that house is similar to theirs. And then I'm going to tell them what it sold for. 
Okay, next property. We're going to do the same thing. And I go through this one and I go through, and then they see, okay, okay, next property. So then after we go through it all, then I have my graph on the back that's going to show like what was the average price per square foot, how long did they take to sell, and so on. And then we'll kind of go through all that data together. And after we've reviewed all the data, do I say, so I think if your goal is to be out of this property within this time frame, I would probably list your price right about here. And if you have all the data in front of you, that's very difficult for that seller to be able to dispute the data um, unless they have their own data, which most of the time they don't have. Now, where I would have lost with them is if they had another number in mind and I sat down and I said, it's worth this. They're going to say, great, bye. Right. But if I come in and I show them I've done the research and I show them all of the data and the information um, and then I'm also getting their buy in that. Yep. Nope. That data is correct. That data is correct there's no comps that I've missed, then I think it's a little bit harder for them to argue the price that you've suggested. Now, they may say, gosh, I know you said 500. I really want to list it for 550. I really don't want to go below that. So that's where maybe like this net sheet thing comes into play, right? Because you're able to then pull out the net sheet and say, okay, well, what's actually your goal? Because usually the goal isn't sell for 550. The goal is they want to walk away with 200,000. So just get, again, get to the why, like what is the goal here? And what is the, what, what is our old, overarching idea behind why, why we're doing this today? Because if you continue to ask questions, usually you're going to get there. And then that's where sometimes, even if my number is 500, there's this 550, I can pull out my net sheet and we can figure out, okay, well, if your goal is to net this, guess what? You really, as long as you sold for 515, you, you're still going to get there. Let's maybe compromise and we'll go list it at, you know, 520, right? So sometimes you just want to um, go through with them, you know, the statistics and then come to an agreement on what you're going to do moving forward. And then um, the other thing, if they want to go really high on the listing price, I might indulge that seller at a higher price. But here's what I will do. Um, I will say, okay. Um, but if you look at the comparables that we just went over, it looks like most of them are selling in an average of 17 days. And then we'll kind of review again. So this one sold in three days, this one sold in 24, this one sold in whatever. Okay, so let's go ahead and list it a little bit higher. But if the average is 17 days, if we don't have an offer by 30 days, so that would be double the average, right? then let's agree that we have overpriced the home and we're going to agree to do a price reduction at that time. And I think as long as you set them up for, here's the expectation, here's mathematically how I have come to this number, and then here's kind of what I think our strategy should be if we don't get an offer in this time, then you have their buy-in and they're not mad at you for, for underpricing it and they don't, they're don't they not upset with your number. They recognize that you're you're doing this with them together and you're also coming from a place of, facts and data and numbers, not just, this is just my opinion, right? Um, and so usually I think you you get um, a lot a lot more buy-in if, if, you, if you do it that way. So I would highly recommend to do that. And then I think usually uh, at the end of the appointment, we're closing, we're choosing um, when we're going to set up pictures or kind of what our next step is going to be. Now in a perfect appointment, our next step would probably be we're going to get pictures scheduled. Um, and so I would, um, one of my photographers here were able to just kind of do it on our phone, like, which is kind of cool because that way it really helps me close that appointment. Okay, guys, pictures are going to be on Thursday at two. And then they're like, all right, cool. This is what we're doing. Um, and then maybe at that time, we're also going to, um, plan like when our open house is going to be and kind of set, set this plan in motion. I will always leave that appointment. I will send them a thank you card in the mail, handwritten, and then I also so like a follow-up email with like what we talked about. Here's the comparables we went over. Here's our game plan moving forward. We've agreed, we'll list it at 550, but if we don't have an offer in 30 days, then we will agree to adjust the price to 525 or wh whatever the case may be. So everybody's on the same page about what it is that we're going to do moving forward. Um, and I think, I think again, like as long as they feel, because in that doing the appointment that way, you've showed up on time, you've looked at the house, you've given them a chance to articulate to you what's important to them, and you've given them a chance to talk. And then after you've heard all that, then you kind of give them your opinion. I think that works a lot better and helps them to feel as though they've been heard um, and that you're on their team. The agent that comes in and is full of ego and wants to just sit down and tell them how they're going to do it, they don't feel like that person is um, in their corner um, or really cares about them or what they're trying to do. They kind of more feel like the agent is working for the agent, not for them. So I think that's why I probably structure things the way that I do.
Um, your needs come first. Okay. Yep. Covered that. So, um, I think they give you some ways to maybe go three deep and like ask the question of like, okay, well, how do we make that happen for you? Or why is that important to you? I think again, if you continue to ask questions to people and just let them talk, um, you'll be amazed at the things that you find out. And I think that really helps you to like uncover the gold of like, okay, well, what are we really trying to accomplish? And what are really the goals here? Because again, if you aren't clear on that, like it's really hard for you to help them. And I think sometimes, especially right now, um, sometimes these situations are like embarrassing for people and they really don't want to um, tell you what's really going on. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they're nervous about things. So I think, um, I think if, if you can go in and, um, you know, really just kind of get down to the nuts and bolts of like what's important to them, then that that's going to ultimately help both of you to, to be successful. I am knowledgeable, caring, and the best agents for these clients. They will appreciate my expertise, preparation, and chose me to represent them as they sell their home. Yep, that's what I think. Um, and so again things that I would take away from this sentence are expertise and preparation. So you better show up and be an expert and you better prepare. So always over prepare for those appointments. Um, I would spend a lot of time, especially if you're new on your market analysis report, I would not only look at comparable sales, I would look at active listings because that is your competition. I would go and tour the active listing so that you have more knowledge to be able to draw from and tell them, well, I actually looked at that house and here's what I think and here's why I think it's better or I think it's worse. Um, and then I think, um, you know, you also want to, so another idea too is if I'm preparing for, um, the listing and I'm doing a, a market analysis report, what you are taught to do is you're taught to pull comparables that are within, you know, let's say 200 square feet within this radius, um, what have you. And so a lot of times you're going to miss properties that might be like on their street. So the other thing that I would do is, yeah, do your analysis the way that you're taught to do by finding comparables that are truly comparable to their home. But you also want to go like drive through the neighborhood and just see, is there anything else that's on the market that I'm missing right now? Or is there a for sale by owner down the street that I'm not seeing because it didn't come up on MLS, right? Because your seller knows about those properties and they know what they're priced at. And again, I think you want to over prepare to be able to win that when that listing and again show that you're you're really vested in their success. Um okay, in KW command. So yeah, update your stage. I mean, I do that. I think it's helpful because it also helps me to just kind of see kind of who I've got, what what's going on. Pretty easy to use. Uh, listing walkthrough. We talked about that. Let them lead the way. Let them show you the house. Let them point things out. Um, the only things that I'm really going to note during this are things that like I, I'm in a note need to be repaired. Um, and I don't talk about that as we're walking through. Um, if we're walking through and there's like some glaring issue, like, I don't know, the ceiling's caving in then I'm probably going to be like, Hey, what's, uh, what's going on here? Um, but usually I'm going to save all that up for the end when we're sitting at the table together and we're going to kind of talk about everything all at once. Um, but the listing walkthrough, yes, it's your opportunity to see the house and yes, it's informative, but it's really the seller's opportunity to show you um, everything about the house and what's important to them. Handwritten, thank you. Yep, send them a note. Um, and you know, it can be really simple. Just Mrs. Smith, thank you so much for having me at your house. I'm really um, looking forward to getting to work with you and getting you to, you know, your next home in Washington. Ahas. Nothing. Okay. Um, listing agreement. Okay. So again, um, I want to have them sign that as soon as possible. And I kind of covered why I think even if we're a month out, like as long as, long as they sign the agreement, I know that they're committed to working with me and then they can't go find somebody, um, you know, their friend's cousin at work, um, is going to buy the house. And then I miss out on that opportunity. Or, you know, they run into somebody at the farmer's market that's, oh, that's my friend from high school and I forgot she was a realtor. I'm going to use her instead, right? So you want to go ahead and get them signed as soon as you possibly can in order to kind of lock that down. Um, any ahas on that? Listing agreement. I mean, I for the listing, when I go there, like I'm always going to bring it with me. Like I'll always just bring a blank one. Um, we can fill it out in person. 
I mean, ideally, I'd kind of like to donkey sign it to them. But if I'm in a situation where I think they might be interviewing somebody else or I might lose that listing if I don't have them sign like quickly, then absolutely. I'm, I, I'll just bring a blank one. We'll have it filled out. We'll have it ready to go. And I think the other thing um, I will always like in my preparation, like when I'm doing my analysis and getting everything ready, um, I will always fill in the MLS as though I am going to list it. Like I have my listing all printed and filled out. I have uh, disclosures printed and filled out. Like I'm getting everything prepped because frankly, you're going to do this if you list the house, right? So you may as well just prepare for it. So you're going to do it. Like just assume that close, bring it all with you and let's just get it done. Um, I also find like I'm kind of busy. So like I would rather sit down with them and I'd rather have one long two hour appointment than a one hour appointment. Then I got to go back and we got to do this. And then, oh, we didn't do the disclosure. So now we got to sit down and do those together. So for me, it's a lot of it is just an efficiency thing. Like if I can just come once, I'm going to bring my whole packet of everything. We're going to do it all together and we're going to fill out all these documents like right now. That to me is going to be um, a better use of my time. And it's also a better use of theirs because I also think if you as the agent keep having to come back for more stuff, then it makes it look like you're unorganized and you don't know what you're doing. So if you can just hit them with everything all at once, I think it helps to also solidify your level of professionalism with your client. Uh, ahas to achievement. Okay. Well, do you feel differently? Will you do anything differently? Do we learn anything? Um, yeah, well, considering I just got my first listing, it was exactly what you just said not to do. It was a lot of <laughs> talk, 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 go back to the side, go back to the client, talk, 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 go back. So I learned a lot doing it that way, but obviously I don't prefer to do it that way. So next time I'm going to do a lot more uh, work ahead of time and be ready for that appointment. Cool. And I really, I mean, to that point, like, I think the more that you can prepare up front, like the better and easier everything is from there on. And I've learned that so many times in my business. Like, frankly, I, even when people are writing an offer, I will have them come into the office and we will write, we will do it in person because what I would rather do is I'd rather sit you down and I'd rather go through everything up front right here and go through the contract line by line. And that way they have a level of comfortability and they feel like they know what's going on. And what that saves me is that saves me the phone call at 10 o'clock PM on Saturday when they got scared or nervous about something that they didn't understand. That wasn't a big deal, but in their mind, oh my gosh, the world's going to end. Right. But if I had taken the time on the front end on my schedule to sit down and go over this with them, then I would have saved myself you know, the two hours of drama that happened this over here. Right, um, a lot of stress. I still do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? No. Using okay. counting records is super smart. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm also like, haven't gotten to the point of listing and finding a seller yet. I'm trying to work with somebody that's looking at land, so that'll be interesting. And they have 65 acres, so I have no idea how to even go about it. Okay. That one's just like this big scary monster I don't want to poke at yet. Okay. Yeah. So that's it. And that's my aha. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, my first listing is land too, Ray, and it, it's really, it wasn't what I was expecting. That's for sure. It's way different. It's not that different, but it is. There's like, you wanted comps and stuff and comps are harder to find. Land had electricity and other lands didn't have electricity. So everything around it is just so different compared to his. So I feel your pain there. Yeah, this one's weird. He's saying that he can't divide up the 65 acres into more than two plots. So... Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, in land, I think one of the biggest things that you want to look into is zoning. Um, that's huge, and that will drastically impact pricing. Um, so I would definitely look into that. Yeah, we're residential zoning with electricity. So it basically just needs to be built on. So that bumped our price up a little bit. Anything else?
Okay. Well, um, okay. So I think you guys, I'm not involved in this, but I know you've got your um, contacts added and um, all of your handwritten notes and con conversations, that sort of thing um, to start charting. And okay. And then your warning about the do not call list. Yep. Don't make those calls. Um, okay. I engage every conversation in the spirit of contribution and people are happy to be in relationship with me. Okay. Yep. So there's your affirmation. Um, and I think, you know, I really, I, yes, I think that's true, but also just like be the person that you would want helping you, right? Like your clients are attracted to you because you're probably like them in some way. So just think about like, if I were in their shoes, like what would I really want? And you know, how would I want to be treated? And then I think treat them that way. Like I think as an agent, you really just have to be the shepherd through the process and you just kind of, you never know from the beginning, but of course I'm telling you to find out like what the situation is. And that way you can just be, be kind of their rock and their shepherd through this, through this whole process, because they really probably statistically people only sell their house like every seven years. So like, even if they have sold a house before, it's been a while and it probably was different at that time um, too. And so, you know, they, re they really just need guidance and handholding. So that is that, um, your role playing and then convert okay so I guess I don't know this must be something you guys do your con conversation list I don't know I don't know okay I think we've done that now okay um and then do you have some sort of conversations in your packet or something that I don't have maybe you do um okay I hope this is okay success okay and that what, what do I got here hold on Okay. That's that. Okay. So, um, I assume you must have some sort of like scripts or something that they give you in your packets, maybe. I don't know. Um, what I will say is that, you know, I used to always do script practice. So if it's available to you in your market center or even the, um, zoom one that I know happens, I think it's every day at like eight, eight thirty or something. Highly recommend plugging into that. I think it's super helpful. Um, and even if it's a situation that you're not personally dealing with, like you just never know when you're going to be in that situation. So I would, I'd recommend doing it. I think it's, I think it's helpful. Um, yeah. Anything else I can help anybody with? Like anybody have a deal going on that they need help with or advice or? Um, you probably get this um, from new agents all the time, but um, okay. I'm, I'm a big reader. Like I, when I'm working out other things like that, I mean, of course I'm not physically reading. I like the audible. It's just a little easier to stay active, but mm -hmm. um, what would you recommend? Like, what would be one book that you'd recommend someone read that's just getting into the industry? Oh gosh. Um, well, MREA is a great one. So the millionaire real estate agent. And frankly, like, honestly, if you just follow the systems, like you'll do well. And it's kind of funny, but it's true. Yeah. Um, I'm a, I'm a heart. I'm a, I take a long time to learn things. So, you know, 18 years into this, I'm still, still learning that I should just do what's in the book. Um, so I'd read that, um, Atomic Habits. That's another great book. Um, you know, I like podcasts too, which are kind of similar. Um, yeah. So the MREA does have a podcast. I actually really enjoy it. Millionaire real estate agent. And um, you can listen to that on any of those, but that, that I, I really enjoy a lot um, or bigger pockets. I enjoy that one a lot too. Um, trying to pull up my audible, tell you what else I, I would recommend. Oregon real estate has one. They have a podcast. Oregon. Yeah. Okay. Oregon realtors. Yeah. Okay. One that I just finished was, I mean, I, I'm trying I'm one of those people that like thoughts are going through my head so I'm going to try to instead of just sitting there and ruminating on the same thing sorry I'm yeah getting a, um instead of ruminating on the same thing I like to you know try to learn something new but one that I just did I mean for anyone that wants it the um your first three six five days of real estate that was one I just read it's on audible uh, I don't know what else it's on but that one was really helpful and just how to get started and kind of goes through some of those hesitations like with meeting a seller meeting with buyers other things like that it kind of goes through those and if you're kind of worried about it it handles a lot of those things too so 
the um, Millionaire Real Estate Agent. I read that one a while ago. It's a, it's a great book, but I'll probably refer back to it if yeah. you're saying it's as powerful as it is. I mean, I think so. Um, yeah. And I'm trying to look here what else I have in my my Audible. Um, Atomic Habits, uh, Extreme Ownership. Yep. Um, yeah. Never Split the Difference. That's a great one on negotiation. Yeah, that's fun. Awesome. Anything else? Okay. Well, um, I'm in Eugene. I think most of you know that. So if there's ever anything I can help you with up here, please let me know. I know Ray, I've gotten the pleasure of uh, talking to you and you've hosted an open house for me before. So thank you. Um, I don't know where the rest of you are located, but if there's anything I can do at all, please let me know. Happy to be a resource. And Good job. Congrats on your success. And uh, yeah, thank you for being here today. Thank, thank you, you for your time. Bye. Bye. Bye.